Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my honor to reintroduce to you a guest who, whom you heard yesterday. And uh, a guest, in my opinion, who stole the show, who, who just blew us through the back wall of the theater with some incredible information, uh, delivered with such class and a terrific sense of humor. Uh, but we've heard a lot of other terrific speakers. I want to give them all credit. But we have been hearing lately through research, books, tapes, and movies, a lot about something, a little something called The Matrix. Well, much of the source of this has been from the person I'm about to introduce to you again, someone who has been doing this for 42 years. Got a little video here. Came out back in 1989 called The Matrix of Power. 1989, 12 years ago. This is not new. This is not new. It's been around for a while. It's been thrown around for a while, thrown around Hollywood for a while. Some very interesting people in very interesting places have been looking at this information. And just now, just now, it's starting to explode. Jordan Maxwell has been researching this, as I said, for over 40 years, and a lot of people are just now getting it. They're just now starting to catch up. That's extraordinary. I mean, that is... It's extraordinary how long he's been doing this, and we're just now getting it. Um, and I think that's a, a testament to his hard work. A lot of material has come from his hard work. And I want to acknowledge that. I really, really do, because I don't think it's been acknowledged enough. And I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, you heard a lot from him about religion yesterday. He really lets you have it. Um, you're going to find out why today. Uh, not only has he been researching this himself for a long time, but he takes his audiences into the ancient world, into the deep past. And we're going to look at the astro-theology from which many of these, if not all, religions have been based. Then Jordan and his guest Vic will bring us up to date and address a contemporary audience with materials that I truly think will be empowering. We are talking about solutions here. We are also talking about an exclusive at this conference. So with that, it is my honor and pl uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce Mr. Jordan Maxwell. Thank you. say this, I, I don't mean okay. to ever to offend. Alright, are we alright? <clears throat> yes, today I jumped in your face a bit about religion. Uh, I want to clarify a few things. One, I have the highest of respect for spirituality. I would like to think of myself as a spiritual man. But I also understand that spirituality, true spirituality, from all the way back into ancient history has always been between the individual and the God that created you. I have personally always viewed the concept of God um, from the biblical and I, I, I choose to feel that that is adequate when we are told that we are made in the image and likeness of God. If we're made in the image and likeness of God, and that sounds reasonable to me, 
then I have always viewed the divine presence in the universe that created us that probably thinks like we do. And therefore the things that would offend me, I would expect would offend someone higher than me. And the things that I am happy with, perhaps that one is happy with. And I would never be happy with anyone who usurps my work and my position and lies about me or tells stories about me that are not true. Nobody likes that. Nobody is impressed with people who sell stories in newspapers about you that are a lie just to make money and just for the sake of media. And so I can appreciate that maybe that divine presence in the universe that we call God is not in any way impressed or happy with being misrepresented by little, infantile, small, ill-informed, unread minds who pontificate about who God is. There's no possible way. Manly P. Hall, one of my mentors, Manly Palmer Hall said once that if you can intelligently talk about God to an audience and explain something of importance that your audience can understand about God, then that would prove conclusively you don't know anything. Because any God that your pea brain, ill-informed, uneducated mind can understand cannot be the great creator of the universe. You don't have it yet. And when you think you understand what's going on, you just don't have it yet. You haven't been introduced to the real powers of the universe. All your thinking is is from your religious training. And religion is a product of man's mind. One scientist said it best. The universe is not stranger than you imagine. The universe is stranger than you can imagine. There are things going on out there in the universe. You have no idea in the world what's going on. And consequently, if there is a divine presence in the universe that encompasses life throughout all creation, we haven't got the faintest idea what that one is. But I have the highest of respect for it. I realize that there are concepts and ideas that have been developed by the ancient mankind that have come down to us today that try and explain the phenomena of God. And of that, I have the highest of respect. But I don't appreciate large institutions who are federally protected 501c3 corporations who are nothing more than a business to manipulate your mind. I have no, I have no respect for that. <clears throat> there are many things that I would like to say about religion, but um, uh, keep in mind that I grew up in a very religious family, and I've heard all the stories. Let me go back and say that the earliest mankind, if we can go back in, as far back into mankind's recorded history, we will discover that the greatest enemy that has ever faced the human race, the greatest single enemy that all mankind realized was the most fearful enemy, which today we would refer to as theologically the devil, the prince of darkness. The greatest enemy to the ancient mankind was darkness. When the sun went down, it gets cold and fearful and frightening. They didn't have the homes and the warmth and the protection that we do. They lived in a very hostile environments. And when the sun went down, the animals, the predator animals came out at night and they're hungry, and they're looking for something to eat. And when, they're, when you understand that the poisonous snakes and animals and lions and predator animals are roaming at night, and it's freezing cold, obviously, when you see the sun coming up in the morning, you say, thank God, because now man can be back in control of the earth again. At night, you don't know what's out there but it's hungry and it's looking for you. But when the sun comes up in the morning, all mankind understood as far back as we can go in history that the sun was our savior. 
And if, as I said yesterday, if you don't think the Son is your Savior, wait till it don't come up. We're dead. And ancient mankind, in the ancient writings, they said that the Son was a ball of energy, which it is. And it was giving its energy to the earth. And consequently, the sun has a tremendous amount of energy, the ancients realized. But there's going to come a time when that energy will run out. If you keep playing with the battery and keep draining the battery, the one day the sun will drain out and it's dead. They knew that. So consequently, energy was equated with life because the energy comes from the sun into the flowers, into food, into the animals, and we eat the food and we get the energy. So therefore, the ancient people said that the sun, which obviously doesn't belong to you, doesn't belong to any of us, it belongs to the Creator, so it was God's sun, and God's sun is the light of the world. Of course, the sun is the light of the world. And the sun was giving energy on the earth so we might live. So the concept was is that God's Son is slowly but surely dying that you might live. He's giving his life so that you might live. So that as long as God's Son is our risen Savior, is risen, there will be everlasting life on the earth. Not for you, but life on the earth. So consequently, the Son became synonymous with our Savior, and it began to mutate and evolve until finally we have religions all over the world that are basically teaching the same thing. The Messiah who promised to come back, and he did. He walked on water. Sure, go out in the ocean at 6 o'clock and watch the Son walking on water. And just as you have seen him leave on a cloud, he will come back on a cloud. That's right, watch every night and see if there isn't a cloud when the sun leaves the world. And consequently, every morning when he, when he returns, because our Savior uh, promised he would return, and he does every morning about 545, he is our risen Savior. But he's not going to be your Savior unless he rises. So he can be there, but he's not going to save you unless that sun rises. So consequently, uh, now to bring it down into our modern day, uh, first day of winter, the first day of winter, well, let me go back and say this. If you draw a circle, which the ancient peoples did, draw a circle and put on it 360 dots around the circle. That's 360 degrees around a circle, or 360 days. And if you take the first day of winter and mark one of the dots, it doesn't matter where you start on a circle, mark one as the first day of winter and draw it straight down till you hit the, its mate on the other side, that's the first day of summer, exactly one half of the year, for the first day of winter, the first day of summer. Then across at the 90 degree begins the first day of spring across to the first day of fall. Now you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels that tell the story of God's Son with his chosen twelve, the twelve constellations of the Zodiac, the twelve brothers of Joseph, the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles. I will tell you a secret that it has taken me 42 years to uncover. I don't care if you understand or believe me, I am telling you a truth. All religion in the Western world is based on astrology. Period. End of sentence. The people who run this world from behind the scenes, and I care not what term you give them from the Illuminati or the secret societies, uh, I, I would suggest that one of the most powerful and evil secret societies on the face of the earth that this country faces, one of the most devious and despotic and insidious conspiratorial apparatus operating in this country right now are the Jesuits. I think that we should in this country send every Jesuit back to Rome and kick them out of this country. They're on the payroll. They're on the payroll of an organization that is dedicated to the overthrow of man's freedom. 
All one has to do is go back into Middle Ages, into what is referred to as the Dark Ages, and see what the Church of Rome has done on this earth. It's not the only despotic organization, but it's one of the oldest and the best put together. Out of, out of the Catholic Church has come the Mafia, the Crusades, the most violent bloodshed across Europe. And Europe was dominated by the Pope, and Europe has dominated the world. So for some 2,000 years, bloodshed, war, Vietnam, Cambodia, what do you think is going on around the world? You think for one minute that this country is involved in the bloodshed it is throughout the world and the church has nothing to do with it? You better go back and read history. Consequently, I, I want to make this point about modern day religions. On the first day of summer. Incidentally, you made the cross on the circle, so consequently when you drive by churches today, you will see a cross and you'll see a circle on the cross. The circle on the cross is a sun that dies on the cross of the zodiac. You know, north, east, south, and west. As a matter of fact, north, east, west, and south is what we call news. News is merely north, east, west, and south. It becomes news. Um, on the first day of summer, and I'm going to make this very quick. On the first day of summer, the, the sun is as high in the northern hemisphere as it's going to get. It doesn't go any further north than the first day of summer. It's fully overhead in the northern hemisphere. And each day, every single day, the sun moves imperceptibly, but every day one degree southward. And it keeps moving one degree, but you don't notice it. It's almost imperceptible, but the United States Navy and, and people who have the instruments can tell you. One degree each day it keeps moving until it hits the halfway point. And that is called fall, autumn. Now it's halfway gone. Now for the next three months it's going to keep going until finally it hits its lowest point in the southern sky. When it hits its lowest point, that is the first day of winter, December 22nd. And on December 22nd, the sun finally hits its lowest point. But something interesting happens. For three days, the sun rises on the same exact uh, latitude, the same exact degree. It doesn't go any further south. It doesn't come back north. It rises on the same degree for three days. So the ancients said that whatever has been moving and doing real well all year long stops for three days. So God's son is dead for three days. Then on the fourth day, which is December 25th, the sun moves one degree northward. And the people who, who study such things, like the United States Navy, they will tell you on December 25th the sun rises one degree northward. Now, anything that was dead for three days and is now moving again has been born again. So, therefore, we today celebrate God's son's birthday. He's born again. He's a child now, and now he's going to grow to full manhood. So, as the sun moves uh, toward the northern hemisphere, it hits the equator, and once it crosses over the equator, it is now in spring. We call it spring. And consequently, the ancient people celebrated uh, that celebration because he's coming back now to the northern hemisphere. And so he was dead in the winter. He has been reborn now in the spring, has come back to life, and now he's coming back to save us. So consequently, in the ancient world, when someone died, even today, when someone dies today, we say that grandmother passed last night, or grandfather passed, passed on, or uh, my uncle passed away last night. But always the word is passed. They passed last night, meaning they died. Well, when the sun crosses over the equator on the first day of spring, once it has crossed over and the first day of spring, it has now come back to life in the northern hemisphere. Not fully, but it's on its way now. And consequently, we, the ancient peoples, five to seven hundred years before the Hebrews were in Phoenicia, uh, Palestine, 
the ancient peoples of the world celebrated what they called the first week of spring. And it was called the Passover. Because the sun, which was dead in winter, has passed over the equator and coming back to us. It is now passed over from the death of winter to its new life in spring. And it was referred to as the Passover. So today, when you celebrate the Passover, all it is is the old ancient sun worship that never dies. It's the same old story, worshiping God's sun, the light of the world. However, Christians in Rome would never have anything to do with the Passover because that's Jewish. And of course, we have a better way of doing things. We're Christians. So we're going to have the same identical celebrations, because everybody's always had the same celebrations, but we don't want to call it the Passover. It sounds too Jewish. So we'll call it uh, the resurrection. That sounds much better. So God's Son is resurrected. And so same weekend of the Passover, God's Son is resurrected. And consequently... Christians go out on the first day of first week of spring and they celebrate something called the Easter sunrise celebration. That's right. God's sun is risen in the new constellation which is bringing it back to life in the northern hemisphere. So what I'm saying is that both Judaism and Christianity are nothing more than a continuation of a far more ancient Egyptian, Sumerian, Babylonian, Phoenician, Canaanite, Assyrian uh, system of theology. It's the same old story. This is why the Bible is referred to as the greatest story ever told. It's the only story that's ever been told. It's the most ancient story. It is the greatest story ever told. But I used to get a whipping from my mother for telling stories. So I learned a long time ago, stories are wonderful if they're a metaphor and a symbolic teaching of something. But don't go spreading stories. I prefer truth. Consequently, that's what I have been interested in all my life, getting to the bottom of things. And then, a few years ago, I came to the uh, knowledge that not only was religion and government corrupt, but that most sanctimonious of all institutions on the earth, the law. And if there's anything in, my, if there's anything in this world that I absolutely abhor, Way down deep, is anybody telling me about the law? Whose law? Where does it come from? Show it to me. Well, the policeman represents the law. Where did he get that? Uh, where did he get that uh, responsibility? Where did he get that authority? Oh, well, from the state. Where did the state get it? Well, they got it from the federal government. Where did the federal government get it from? Well, I mean, they got it because somebody has to be in charge. Well, somebody's got to be in charge. I think I'm going to be in charge of me. I'll be in charge of me, and I'll be my own law. Okay? And if you live like that, then you begin to appreciate other people. You begin to appreciate because you don't need someone to teach you what is right and wrong. My God, if you need to be counseled as to what is right and wrong, you've got some serious problems. Most people already know what's right and wrong. They do it anyway, but they know it's wrong. So consequently, the way this country was founded, each individual that came to this country was coming to a country for absolute sovereign freedom. America reverberated around the world to bring freedom to the human family. And because of that, you could wear your own gun. You could do what you want. You could go where you please. You don't get any license. A license implies that you are under the, uh, you're under the domination of a power. As an American, I'm not under the domination of anybody's power, including my mother. I live my own life, okay? It's true. Once you have left your mother's womb, you are now a, an entity in the universe that will deal with God on a personal basis. 
And what your family's done is irrelevant. It's what you do. You can't say, well, my mother did this and my father caused me to do that. No, no. Before God and man, it's what you do. Who are you? And this is what the basis of America was. The individual responsibility that says you are a sovereign. Nobody tells me what I can do. I don't get a license from nobody to do nothing. Period. I don't pay your taxes. I don't crawl on my knees. I don't act like an animal crawling in front of you because you are a, a righteous or you are royalty. There is no such a thing as royalty. You better look at this whole concept of a divine right of kings. This whole thing going on in England with the divine right of kings, with this holy bloodline, I think you better go back and start looking at some of the stuff that David Icke is talking about reptilians. Because if there was some kind of an ancient bloodline from extraterrestrials in Incorporated into our natural evolution, that might serve the basis for saying, well, we have a natural right of kings because of our bloodline. In America, we don't have any of that silly nonsense, a divine right of kings. In America, the way it was, it was formed, as I said yesterday, you've got a falling out with a guy in the bar and you can't, you're carrying a gun and he's carrying a gun. You don't need a divine right of kings. We're out in the street. We take care of it right now. Why? Because you don't mess with me. I'm an American. I'm not. I'm not crawling on my knees on on my knees to some queen. You realize? I don't know if you recall. I don't know if you heard this or not. But it just occurred to me about ten years ago, if you remember this, about ten years ago, a young black man, about eighteen, nineteen years old, broke into the queen mom's bedroom. Do you remember that? And, and one of the servants of the Queen Mum uh, happened to be walking by, and the bedroom door was was uh, was open a bit, and she saw this young black boy in the Queen's bedroom, and so she quietly went. This is in the newspaper. This is the news about ten years ago, and she went to the security and quietly, and the security came up and arrested him for breaking into the Queen's bedroom. Okay. And the queen said, well, first of all, he didn't threaten her, and he wasn't armed, and it was just a childish, silly prank, and so she let it, let it, let it slide, and if he promised not to do that anymore. James Bond couldn't break into the queen's bedroom. If there was a young black man in the Queen's bedroom in Buckingham Palace, the Queen ordered him in like pizza. <laughs> the Queen mum with her black boyfriends. <laughs> Tell me about racism. The most racist, filthiest, dirty bunch of liars the world has ever, ever had to encounter is British royalty. They have taken America's freedom. They have robbed us of our birthright. They have lied to us. The Vatican has made common cause and contractual arrangements with the King of England to rape the world. And I am telling you that if America is not saved, there will be no freedom on the earth. America's freedom was heard around the world because Americans can put guns on their hips and say no man messes with my wife and my children or my country, period. If you don't like it, you get a weapon. I want you out of this country. And that's what made America great all over the world. People respected a man that has had enough and says don't come on my property. And don't mess with my property, my wife, or anything I own, or I'm going to deal with you. And I got a gun here that says I'm going to. Now, what are you going to do about it? And consequently, that's what made America great, is the freedom to respect each other, but to defend your rights as a creature of God created for freedom. And I will tell you, all of the trash you are experiencing right now, and this system is caused by 
the Jesuits, the Catholic Church, and especially British royalty. There is a conspiracy, and you can bet on it. Remember, the people that we Americans fought on the field of battle to get our freedom, who were the redcoats? Who were the enemies of the founding of this country if it wasn't the British royalty? Who was it we were fighting if it wasn't the British royalty? And they have come back, and they've got a score to settle. They know we are a fierce and angry people in America and not to be messed with. So now they've come back and done it a different way. They've kind of made it a law. And you have the law, and the law says you can't do this, and the law says you can't do that. I say to hell with your law. I'm an American, and I don't goddamn appreciate you telling me what I can do in my country on my home territory. I don't respect your law. I'm an American, and I'm tired of people crawling on their knees to the Queen of England, to the Pope in Rome, and to religion, and to government. I've had enough of all of them. As far as I'm concerned, it is now time for people to wake up and take back your freedom. You're an American. You're not a slave. I want the President of the United States and the CIA to wake up every night in the middle of the night in a cold sweat wondering where the hell I am. I want them, I want them to know who I am. I want them to know who I am. All right. I went over time because I want to bring up my friend Victor. Victor is an expert in all of the intricacies of how all of this machinations really work. And I want to bring Victor up so he can explain to you how we got into this mess and what we need to do to get out of it. It's very simple. All you really need to do is just listen to Victor, and he'll explain to you what we need to do to get out of this mess. You want to come up, Victor? I wasn't supposed to speak as long, but I got started, so. Okay, okay, move over. Just okay, move one, two, three, good, okay. I was not supposed to speak this long because I wanted to give Victor some time, but uh, we've got a little time now, so. Uh, what we talked about yesterday, England and the uh, American corporation has manipulated and exploited our ignorance and put over us so-called, quote, laws, end quote. All you need to know is how this stuff works and how to opt out. It's very simple. So I'm going to leave the rest of the program to Victor to explain to you all of the different little intricacies that the government has put on us and what to do about it. Victor. I was told that uh, I'm invited if in one condition that if I have some solution, some good news to share with you. So Jordan is the bad guy, I'm the good guy, I guess. Yeah. So I'm going to try to do my best. We've got a lot of good news, we've got a lot of solutions. People, they should understand that uh, every single thing that happens in our system, uh, it's, it's a big game. And in order to play the game, we have to know the rules and regulations of the game. It's like a tennis court. You don't, want, you don't want to participate in a tennis court if you don't know how to play the game. You have a referee. The referee is, is there not to teach you how to play the game. He's just going to say that the game over, you lose, you win. So that's the court system. Um, my name is Vic Varjabedian. I'm Armenian, born in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, I studied in um, Europe. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I will get these questions often asked of me. How I got to here, who I am, uh, what's my background. Um, I really liked history of the world from my childhood. I uh, tried to uh, get involved in different cultures. Um, Egyptian culture was one of them, uh, European culture, Russian culture. Uh, I moved to Canada for 10 years, and then I moved to Los Angeles in 86. I've been in Los Angeles since then. Um, my background is international banking. I do a lot of business in Europe. And at the same time, I learned a lot of uh, tricks that uh, the banking institution, they dominate the whole world. 
Um, when I came to Los Angeles, I had my own business for four years, and I thought that I'm doing pretty well. I was importing and exporting from Europe and the Orient. And after four years growing up my business, finally I found out in the same problem that every single person gets involved, which is four or five major companies that I was selling them products, um, they stopped paying me. So as any other person, I would hire an attorney, and he assured me that everything will be fine. Uh, it's a win-win situation. You've got the order, their signature, big companies. Um, we should file a lawsuit. So we did. After one year spending $15,000 on an attorney, I got the bad news. They filed bankruptcies. This is the first time that I hear about bankruptcy, even though I knew about the bankruptcy, but I never thought that it's so easy. It happened to me. I lost a lot of money. Uh, it was a lot of money for me, but a lot of money. I was forced out of business. However, I just realized that United States, it's a different country. I better do my homework. So since then, I started studying, and I started studying not on the banking side, but I studied the court procedures and how to learn um, the rules of the game. And it, it was very fascinating. Of course, in 91, I met Jordan, and he saved me 40 years of knowledge of studying more so I got a lot of stuff from him regarding religion and astrotheology. But I was more concerned about if I'm staying in the United States, how I'm going to be behaving in this corporate world. I got to learn the rules. I want to play the game. I have no choice. So I started researching, going to seminars. Um, I met wonderful people. Um, I pinpoint some key people. And basically, we set up an organization which is called BBCOA. It's a publishing company, but it's based in Los Angeles. And our, our um, mission is not only to publish books. However, our mission is to finance authors, which they're worth it, their material would like to bring it to the light, to the public, so that they can use it. Now, my first experience with the court, and I have to say that so that you know where I'm coming from, in 92, I got a traffic ticket. That was the time I said to myself, I would like to see whatever I learned, if it's going to be really effective in the system. So for the first time in my life, I go to the court, traffic court. I'm pretty sure most of you, you've been there once. Uh, it's a business. They're there to make money. And we're the clients. However, I knew a lot of stuff about the court procedure and how they function. So I wanted to test myself before going forward. Among 200 people, I was probably in the middle, and uh, I kept timing each person having 30 seconds to say whatever they need to say. And of course, the only thing you can say, either guilty, no guilty, no content. And basically, every 30 seconds, I see anywhere from $50 to $600 the machine is just cranking all this business. So I was just in the middle, and the commissioner, I guess, they, they asked my name. And of course, my name is Vic Varjabedian, so he probably said that this guy, five seconds max. This is 30 <laughs> seconds for everyone. So I appear over there, and I say, um, after telling me that I violated so code so-and-so in vehicle code, and I was speeding 70 miles an hour or whatever, how do I plead? And the first thing came out of my mouth is I'm appearing especially not generally. Now, the whole court system stopped. <laughs> so, and the judge looked at me and says, who the hell is this guy? I mean, he's coming from, with a weird name, with an accent. I'm pretty sure he's not born in the state. And now he's asking me something that I cannot go forward. And he just looked at me and he says, okay. And I, and I asked him, I said, is this a court of record? And he says, well, we don't have a court reporter, but we're taping this uh, proceeding. I said, let's the record shows that um, I'm reserving all my rights not to be bound by any unrevealed contracts. Now, I know what I'm talking about. He knows what I'm talking about. None of the other people knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and basically, what I'm trying to put in the records that I do have a driver's license, and I know that it's a just um, a contract which it binds you with all the rules and regulations. However, if you reserve your rights, they never showed it to you when they issued it. 
and you thought that you're just getting it to drive. So basically, I'm reserving all my rights. Nothing applies to me. And that's in the record. And he looked at me and he says, okay. And I said, uh, I would like to see a verified complaint filed by the city attorney under penalty of perjury that there is a uh, crime that I committed. And I would like to see the witness. A verified complaint. Basically, I'm asking for a verified complaint. And at that moment, he felt that this is not going anywhere. And I'm a bad client, and there are another hundred people that they're good clients. So he says, do we have a verified complaint to the bailiff? He says, no, we don't have one on hand. Okay, we're going to reschedule you. And I was out of there. Now, when I got out, I realized that I was one of the only people, probably, that I, I, I just rescheduled. All the other people was guilty, no guilty, no content. And every single one of them, they cannot even ask the court jurisdiction if there is a complaint filed or not. This is very tricky. The court, as I said, it's a game. The court is a computer. Someone has to activate. Someone has to file a complaint. If no one files a complaint, the court doesn't have any jurisdiction. Now, who filed the complaint? Well, we're going to say that the cop. Based on what? Well, he gave me a ticket. Well, that was a notice to appear. Well, I appeared. So what's the problem? <laughs> I don't see any crime over here. If, if there was a crime, who's the damaged party? Well, the second, after one week when they rescheduled, I went to the court and I knew what's going to happen, so I took four of my bodies with me to the court just to be witnesses. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I know exactly what I'm going to do. And, of course, I was the last person in the court. They made sure that everybody was out. <laughs> and after, and they start asking my friends if they had any case, and they missed their name, and they said, no, 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 we're with him. So he says, okay. So they asked me to go to approach the bench, which I did. And the first thing um, the judge says, well, city attorney, there was a lady sitting on the left side, and says, city attorney, do we have a verified complaint for this gentleman? Oh, she says, oh, yeah, we do. I was really surprised. I never thought that they would have such a document. So the first time I look at the document, it's not signed. I says, well, this is not valid. It's not signed. No one is taking any responsibility. And at that time, the, uh, the commissioner, I'm, I'm going to say commissioner because he's not a judge, commissioner. The commissioner, he looked at me and he was really coming strong and he says, Mr. Vajabedian, you are wasting the court's time. And I says, you know what, I'm not paid coming over here. You guys are paid. This is my court date, and I'm asking for a signature. So the city attorney was laughing, and she says, basically, I have no problem signing it. That was a big surprise. How can she sign being a witness on a crime? So I'm thinking, what's my next thing? I mean, I'm just blocked. <laughs> so as soon as the bailiff gives me the letter... It was a pink letter. I kept it so far. Uh, the judge says, the commissioner tells me, uh, Mr. Vajabedian, do you acknowledge receiving a verified complaint? I says, can I read first what I'm acknowledging? So as soon as I start reading, at the same time I'm thinking, what I'm supposed to do now? The first two sentences, and it clicked me. Based on belief and information, the city attorney testifies that city of the state of California got damaged because of my speeding. And as soon as I heard this based on belief on information, I took the paper, I was like feeling like, oh boy, I've got the guns now, and I threw Well, we don't have it. This is all we have. I said then, I would like the court to schedule for a prob probable cause hearing. And he says, well, I cannot do that. And I said, well, if you cannot do that, you have to dismiss the case. And he says, Mr. Varjabedian, are you, uh, by any chance, uh, were you going on 70 miles an hour? I said, uh, well, I don't understand the charges. You see, you don't have to answer. I said, I don't understand the charges. Well, if you don't understand the charges, they cannot go forward. They're going to have to explain you. He says, why, why, why don't you understand the charges? Were you going on 70 or not? I says, well, 
I don't understand if this is a criminal or civil. He wasn't expecting. And then he says, well, usually traffic citation, now he became really down on me. Traffic citation, the fraction, they're criminal. I says, well, if it's a criminal, of course they cannot say civil, otherwise you're in the wrong court. So it has to be criminal. So I said, well, if it's a criminal, uh, as far as I understand, there are two types of criminal actions. One is violating a contract, the other one is having a damaged party. And right away he says, are you an attorney? I says, no, I'm not an attorney, but I'm studying the law. He says, well, we're going to assign you an attorney. I says, I object. He says, overruled. He says, I said, exceptions. These are few words that you can use. It means different things. Overruling the, 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 uh, the judge or the commissioner, it means, are you sure about it? That you're objecting it. And if you, if you say exceptions, that means I'm damn sure about it. So they cannot go forward. So at that point, of course, they're going to try to do all the tricks. And the judge, uh, the commissioner told me, now, you understand that you are waiving your right to be presented by an attorney. And I said, I'm reserving my right not to be bound by any attorney representing me. So I want to make the table clear that he understands where I'm coming from. That's not a privilege, having an attorney. I want to reserve my right not to have an attorney. That's period. As soon as I accept the attorney, I'm done. I cannot even discuss about the court's jurisdiction. Attorney is an officer of the court, and that's the end of it. So just to make it short, um, he pleaded not guilty for me. I objected. He overruled our exceptions. So he, he put down that, okay, you objected uh, to my ruling, so why don't you come back? Now, I went outside. It was a $110 ticket. Now, this is the second time I'm coming. I'm wasting like five hours of my time. However, this is an excellent experience for me just to find out the whole court system with the guns and the sheriffs and the marshals and everybody in it, what can they do if you know what you're doing? Just few things. So basically when I went out, I said, I'm going to have to put a stop to this. So I went back and I prepared affidavits, heavy duty affidavits, criminal charges against the judge, criminal charges against the bailiff, criminal charge against everyone. If I walk in the court, if they don't hand me a verified complaint signed by the city attorney, I am filing the criminal charges. That's basically what I said. So as soon as I walk in, they, I guess they, uh, there was a couple of more guys before me, and then I stood up and he says, dismissed. I said, uh, um, why? <laughs> I'd like to know the reason. He looked at me with a very dirty look. He says, the cop didn't show up. Wow, that wasn't a time for the cop. Still, they didn't have any jurisdiction. Um, so this is my experience with the court. So when I left the court, I says, I like this game. I'm going to start studying more. I'd like to really investigate what is really happening and what we can do so that we can stop all these um, jerks. I'm sorry for my language. Um, since then, I started to really investigate in other fields. Uh, traffic court, by the way, this is one of the good news I can give you. You don't even have to appear in front of anyone. Uh, it's very simple procedure. We simplified the whole thing. You can get a package from us, 100% guaranteed. You will never see the judge or a commissioner. Before even telling you what the package is about, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the legality behind it. When the cop stops you, first of all, he has to have a warrant to arrest you. Otherwise, he cannot stop you. Now, you're going on 70 miles an hour. The law is very uh, simple. If I call you today and I say that I'm coming to kill you, and my neighbor calls the cops, all the cop is going to tell her, um, we cannot stop him. If he commits the crime, then we can arrest him. That's the law. So basically, when you're going 80 miles an hour, you're not steal, you're not damaged, you're not damaging anyone. So you, you haven't really committed the crime. There is no crime yet. Even though if you're drunk and you're driving, there are a lot of DUIs that we help. 
if they stop you, they will arrest you probably, and they will try to give you an attorney immediately, because they don't want you to discuss about jurisdiction of the court. What is the crime? You haven't hit someone yet. So if you're drunk and your car really is going from first lane to the fourth lane, coming back, but still you haven't committed the crime, there is no crime. That's in black and white. So basically when the cop stops you, he is violating some of the rules and regulations. However, you don't want to really discuss with the cop. Just get the damn ticket. Take the promise you note, just sign, tell him thank you, and just take it. That's all you want to do with them, because cops, they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> get the ticket. The ticket basically, and I'll tell you why you haven't committed the crime. The ticket basically, it's a promise to appear. You are signing, you are entering in a contract to appear in the court on such a date. And the ticket will say on or before. And usually the date will be 30 days or 40 days later. And then you look at the ticket, you say, oh, I've got 45 days. You're happy. However, there is a trick in it. You offended a code, so you are an offender. After 10 days or 30 days, when you go to the court, they call you a defender. What happened? You were an offender, you became a defender. Well, you passed the 10 days, the 10 days in the commercial process. That means you accepted whatever they gave you. So basically, even though not to get involved with that, when you get a ticket, which is a promise to pay, a promise to appear, I'm sorry, all you have to do, take a couple of your friends, the next day or the second day or the third day, don't pass seven days. Go to the clerk of the court, because the ticket will say, you have to appear in front of the clerk of the court on such a date or before. So if you appear before, it's okay, right? But most of the people, they appear on that date, which is too late. So just appear two days later and ask the clerk of the court, basically, that you want to see the magistrate, because that's the reason why you have to appear. And the clerk will tell you, basically, that, uh, I'm sorry, but you're not in the computer yet. Now, you ask one more time, are you basically telling me that I cannot see the magistrate? And she's going to say, well, I'm sorry, you have to come back. You say, well, but however, I promise to appear on or before such a date. Now, is today's before? Yes, but I'm sorry. So you've got these two witnesses. Make sure that you have the name of the clerk and the time and the conversation, and you ask three times to see a magistrate, and they refuse you. So what you want to do, you go back home, do a couple of affidavits for your friends testifying that you appeared on such a date and the clerk refused to give you a magistrate. And there's another affidavit that you can put some of the citations, put it together with the ticket, send it back to the uh, court. And that's the end of hearing from the court. Check after 10 days to see if your name is there. Believe me, it's not going to be there. You did appear, so there is no warrant at all. The reason why they issue warrants, when you don't appear as you promised, you're breaking a contract. So you want to eliminate all these things. So we do have a nice package. You can get it from us. The affidavits are ready. We tested it 45 times, by the way. So 100% success. You don't see anyone, just the clerk of the court. So as long as you don't pass the 10 days. Now, we have another scenario in our package. If you pass the 10 days, what you should do. So it will explain you in that situation also. But the 100% guarantee is if you go after seven days of getting the notice to appear. If you get it, okay, the question we're going to have to leave it for, for tonight because I'm short of time and I've got a lot to say. However, it, it depends, and we, we will discuss about that. As long as the notice to appear, yes. And as long as there is no damaged party, yes. Um, the reason why I shared with you this uh, in 91, whatever it happened to me, because I'm not born in the United States. I've been here for 15 years. Yes, I did my homework. However, English language is my fourth language. So um, it's difficult for me, probably, to read some of the rules and regulations, um, go through. I have to think in four different languages and translate to English before even I can speak to the judge or commissioner or start putting these packages together. 
Now, you are born in the United States, you're fluent in English, uh, there is no reason why you shouldn't go up there and start educating yourself. There's a lot over there that you can do. And I will show you what you can do being in the system and what you can do being out of the system. You have a choice. We have a lot of problems in this country. Bankruptcy is one of them. As a matter of fact, before the bankruptcy is the credit cards. We have a big problem with credit cards. Credit cards, it's a gimmick. I'm not going to discuss about the banking system, how they set it up, but I will discuss about how we can resolve it. Now, so far, we used to file Chapter 7 to get rid of all the credit card debts. Every seven years, you have the right. However, George Bush has just signed a bill, which basically it's going to eliminate anyone to file a bankruptcy against credit cards. It's been passed already. It's not in uh, functioning yet, but it's passed already. And it's really weird because bankruptcy is for corporation, but then you will understand that you are a corporation. All your capital letters is corporation. So they're going to restrict the American people to file bankruptcies on their debts, which is the main reason why people, they can make a living in this country. 95% they're based on credit cards. If you go back to other cultures, a company wouldn't go bankrupt if for the next 30 years the business is down. Why? Because everything was done, the basis was done by paying it, not credit. In this country, you will hear that uh, a company with 650 stores, they will go bankrupt if three months the quota went 20 or 30 percent down. Why? Because the whole system is, bank uh, is credit. So what I'm saying is the credit card is a main issue that everyone is faced. Well, it's very easy to uh, resolve this problem. It's a few techniques that you need to learn. We have three books and a CD with all the forms that you need. It's not a big deal. Uh, all you have to do is just follow the instructions. Just to let you know what is covering the background for the elimination of the credit card without filing a bankruptcy, what it's coming from. The banks, they cannot loan money. The banks cannot loan money, and they don't have any money to, to lend you. The banks will lend you credit. Credit is belief. It's not money. It doesn't cost the bank to give you $5,000 worth of credit. You know why? Because the $5,000 credit was created by your signature when you applied for the $5,000. In this country, as of 1933, all the money is created by you, by your signatures. As soon as you put your signature on a document, money is created. This is banking regulations, by the way, as of 33. 33 was a bankruptcy for the U.S. corporation. So we don't have any money in the system. All we have is credit. And the credit is created by your signature. Every time you apply for a home loan, you go to the bank, they ask you to sign a promissory note before even giving you anything. You sign the promissory note. Guess what? Now the bank has a receivable that you signed for $300,000 that they can take that acceptance, bank acceptance they call it. They can forge your signature in the back of that promissory note, open a bank account in your name, deposit. Receivables becomes uh, cash for them, by the way and issue a credit and give it back to you. So basically, you are creating the money and they're giving it back to you and now they put a, UC, uh, a, um, a financing statement which a UCC filing against your property. What it costs the bank if you don't pay them? Nothing. As long as it didn't cost them anything, they're not entitled to get anything. So just follow the instructions and you will see it's so simple. It just you have to get used to the, uh, the way that you were dealing with the banks. It's a little bit different than how you have to deal with the banks. And I can guarantee you, we have 100% success. We've been doing this for years now. Um, there is probably less than 1% that goes to the, to the court because of the fact that the, uh, the amount on one card is like over $10,000. But we have no loss even in the courts. So it's 100% guaranteed on unsecured credit cards, Visa and, and MasterCard. You don't have to do bankruptcy. Don't worry about the new regulations. Just use, you get the book once, and afterwards, 
just use it forever. Now, the second thing, of course, that people, they face, which is the uh, credit report. Credit report, for the first time, believe it or not, we have good attorneys that basically they will go after all the reporting agencies for a minimum fee and they will clean everything on your credit report. I don't care if it's an IRS lien, levies, franchise tax board, uh, judgments, whatever it is. They'll just clean it in a matter of three months. And this is basically done because um, credit reporting agencies, they've got 200, over 200 regulations they have to follow before putting your name on the credit report for the public, which they don't do it. If you try to do it, you're not going to succeed. However, if an attorney does it with over 10 years of experience, they will basically take it away because of so many reasons. However, we are getting short in time, so I'm going to just move forward. Um, for those who doesn't have any credit, uh, they would like to establish credit. Still, we have attorneys that they will put like $80,000 worth of credit on your reports. It goes back three years, showing that you were granted up to $80,000 credit. You made your payments for three years in time, and today you have $80,000 worth of credit available. So <coughs> your scoring probably will be high. The reason why I'm doing this thing, somebody's going to say, this is unethical. You get rid of the credit cards, then you want to clean your reporting agencies, now you want to put more credit, and now you start all over again. Guess what? It's a game, they started it, we continue it, that's all. <laughs> Money judgments. Money judgments, just following, we've got 15 minutes left? Oh, we've got one hour left, good. Money judgments. Um, money judgments, it's a little bit uh, difficult to explain. I'm going to have to talk about half an hour just on that subject to show you why we don't have any money today to pay for anything. So if there is no money, you cannot pay it. So if you have a money judgment, we have a package. Just send it to the judge. And that should take care of it. <laughs> but only for money judgments. Now, um, I guess we covered all those. Okay, there are two main things that it remains, so it's good that we have one hour left. Um, I'm pretty sure some of you heard about the UCC process, the redemption process, with the publisher of the book, Cracking the Code, Redemption in Law. Uh, we did finance, I'm not the author by the way, I'm just a publisher. However, I'm extremely familiar with uh, what, it's, well, what it's in that book. Um, BBC OA, that's the company name, uh, finances, as I said, some of the authors so that we can bring all this knowledge. However, we do not publish anything that we don't test it, we don't have the proof of the pudding, uh, we don't experience personally, we do not. So anything that you get from us, it will be based on results, not theories. Even though it says cracking the, the code, theory and practice, that's for educational purposes. However, just to give you an idea about the redemption process, uh, according to the Treasury Department of the United States, there is over 11 million filings in the last two years. The national debt, of course, when a country borrows money, its own money, you cannot pay off the national debt. I don't care what they say in the Congress. I don't care what they advertise. Uh, we're paying the national debt with one trillion dollars. Uh, there is a reason for that. However, mathematically, it's impossible. If a country borrows hundred dollars, and after one year they have to pay hundred and five because the, the interest was created, and there is only hundred dollars in circulation, how are you going to pay? It? You're going to have to borrow more. And just imagine billions and trillions of dollars that the U.S. government borrows from the Federal Reserve, and the interest starts accumulating and accumulating. So there is no way to pay off the national debt. However, um, there was a clock, a big clock. I think it was a six-foot clock uh, in New York, one of the buildings. I forgot the name. And uh, it used to have about probably eight to nine dials and it shows how much debt we're occurring as Americans. And the last three cylinders was moving so fast you cannot even see it on a daily basis. 
last year, I think it was December, that clock starts slowing down. Now you can see the third dial and the second cylinder and the first. And then suddenly it starts going backwards. And since it starts going backwards and starts accelerating, they thought that that's bad news. So they removed the whole clock. They don't want you to see that the national debt is going down. Uh, they want to advertise anything that has to do with bad news. Anything with good news, they don't, want to, they don't want you to see it. So they took the whole clock out. Now, it's a coincidence because nothing changed in the monetary system. However, redemption is a process that since you created the money to start with, or the government is creating money out of your name, when you accept any charges for value, you can send it to the Department of the Treasury so that it will be discharged. The first thing that you accept is your birth certificate, which it's one million dollar value. You accept it for one million, you take it from the public side to your private side, and then you file it in with the Secretary of the State as your own asset, and then you make a bill of exchange and send it to the Department of the Treasury. By the way, the Department of the Treasury has nothing to do with the United States Treasury. The Department of the Treasury is an escrow company between the United States government and the Federal Reserve System. They just balance the books. How much money we borrowed, how much money we took out of the taxes through the IRS, and the IRS, as soon as they take their few uh, billions, they will notify the Treasury so that they can reduce it from the national debt. Then they will give more money. So this is keep going and going and going. So what I'm coming to say that since 11 million people accepting $1 million worth of um, credits, taking it out of the public side and accepting it on their private side and send it to the Treasury Department to reduce the national debt, that's almost $11 trillion by itself. Now, some people, they accept $400 million, some stuff, because basically a creditor can decide how much you want to put a value on something that someone is offering you out of your name. We have a lot of successes uh, in this redemption. I get a lot of emails, uh, hundreds of emails, faxes, telephones. A lot of people, they don't even know what they're doing. They're just using some of the instructions in the book. And some people, they're not even winning. They're losing. That's fine. However, it's a vehicle. You have to know how to proceed so that you can succeed. If you don't know how to drive the car, of course you're going to have an accident. Uh, <laughs> Something that I, uh, I really, um, when I heard about it, I started laughing um, in the American's Bulletin magazine. Um, we ask everyone to send all their success stories to the American Bulletin magazine. Um, one of the stories last month that I was reading, it was really strange. Uh, someone had a dog, and the dog was loose, I guess, and uh, it was running in the streets, and they confiscated the dog. And uh, they, they called him or sent him a letter saying that we have your dog. If you want, you want to come and pick it up, you have to pay a $60 fine. This guy basically, he, put ev he accepted everything for value. I mean, anything that he has in his household, uh, including uh, the TV, the forks, the knives, everything. He just named them, including the dog. So he goes over there and he says, I'd like to get my dog. And they tell him that, well, you're going to have to pay a $60 fine. He says, I don't have the money, but I do have... A piece of paper is UCC1. Now, believe it or not, they read the paper and they say, well, it sounds like either we're going to have to return the dog or we're going to have to pay a million dollar check to you. So we'd rather give you the dog. <laughs> he put a one million dollar security interest on the dog. So if you want to get the dog, you have to pay the first creditor first in line, which is him. So that was really neat. Um, another, uh, I'm going to say this one too because it's really, um, it's nice to hear. Another doctor, which I think he was involved in labs, and he works with a lot of uh, doctors. He does blood tests. Uh, he just called our office and he says that basically all his creditors, they're forcing him to, to file bankruptcy. And he wanted to do a UCC process. It was a rush job, so we did it for him. And... Um, at the same time, they pushed him to Chapter 11, which is renegotiation. And uh, I guess they didn't accept the terms, so they pushed him to Chapter 7, since he had a lot of assets, and they wanted to sell all his properties to get the money. 
um, he submitted to the bankruptcy court his UCC1. Now, one week later, I was not in the office. My secretary tells me that so-and-so called, and he was really, um, he wasn't normal. I says, why, what's wrong? He says that, is this a gimmick, the UCC1? I says, I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, you better talk with this guy. So I called him. I says, what do you mean it's a gimmick? He says, well, the court sent me, after liquidating all my assets, they sent me one check to me, not the creditors. And he says, I don't understand. What is this? Well, I said, obviously, you're the first in line. You're the only person who filed the claim with the Secretary of the State. And you put a $100 million against your name. So anything comes out of your name the first creditor gets paid first. So you're the first before anybody else. So you got the check. So he cashed it. <laughs> That's good. So the reason why I'm, I'm telling you these stories is because these are um, stories that uh, they're unusual. We've got tons of them, but these are unusual stories. Now, in order to explain a little bit more about the UCC, it takes really a lot of time to explain. We do have a book. It's over 430 pages. It explains in details step by step. However, I would like to talk about um, the way that the natural law is set up, what is the law, and what is the statute, which is very important for you to know. Now, the whole thing is so simple that sometimes we miss it. We know that God created man. So obviously, in our term, we cannot have a claim against our creator which is God. Men created a constitution, which is a contract. They made sure that that contract would not backfire to them. So basically, they made sure that the constitution will create a government, giving them a limited power to serve them, the people. So obviously, the way that it was set up, the government cannot go on top of the people. And government created corporations. Now, today, it's really strange. This is the natural law, and somehow we look to ourselves and we say that, well, the government is above us. What happened? It's impossible. Well, it's very simple. This was planned a long time ago. This is not something that happened just now. It goes back to 1862. However, it was so cleverly done that... Um, all these licenses that people they need, they need it because they're U.S. citizens. They don't need it because they're American citizens. Before the 14th Amendment, no one needed any license to do anything. We started getting licenses. What is a license? It's a permission from someone to do something. Otherwise, it's illegal. Well, to get married, you need a license, I guess, marriage certificate. What's illegal about marriage that you need a permission, otherwise it's illegal? It doesn't make sense. Um, driver's license. It's illegal to drive in on, on public roads unless you have a permission. It doesn't make sense. And all the licenses, it doesn't make sense. However, you need to have a license as a U.S. person. The whole thing started in 1862. Before coming that, I'm going to just tell you uh, the definition of the law. I'm going to have to read it because it's so difficult. I want you to know about it. Do not injure any humans, person, property, or rights. That's all you have to know about natural law. If you know this one sentence, you're not going to be doing anything against the law, natural law. However, the judge tells you today that... Ignorance of the law is no excuse. What is talking about? No, we understand this sentence, but what is talking about? The last time that I checked with the, the Library of Congress, there are over 3 million law books with over 60 million uh, statutes. When the judge tells you that ignorance of the law is no excuse, 80 million statutes, 60 million statutes, I'm supposed to know not to violate one of them? It doesn't make sense. However, the law is very precise, very clear. Not for, America, not for U.S. citizens, though. That's for American citizens. As a U.S. citizens, you are under all these statutes. Everything applies to you. 
all the rules, regulations, licenses, everything. So how we got in this mess to start with? Well, it started when the government, the Congress, the 40th Congress in 1862, I think it's 1862, just check on that. I'm sorry, 1868. 1868, uh, they created what is called the 14th Amendment. It was sold to the American people as the end of the slavery for the colored black people. Well, it wasn't black people because it made slavery for everyone. However, once they created the 14th Amendment, now they established the corporate United States not incorporated yet. Three years later, Washington DC became incorporated, which is the United States Corporation. Now, so far, American citizens, they're not realizing what's happening. Everything is normal, normal business. So they just start gradually, they start setting up the stage. Then it became 1913, when the Federal Reserve Act passed, Congress lost the power to print the coin, and we gave it to the international bankers. And the excuse was, we're going to take it out of the politicians' hands, we're going to give it to the experts, Rothschild, in the banking business for so many hundreds of years. Okay. Well, when we started borrowing our money, we started paying interest. However, the deal was, we were supposed to pay with gold and silver. They don't want to get it in Federal Reserve notes. 1913 to 1933, there were ships sailing from the West Coast all the way to Europe full of gold and silver paying interest. By 1933, there was no more gold or silver left. So they had to file a bankruptcy. But who's filing a bankruptcy? The government, Congress. Once the, the, the bankruptcy was filed, then obviously the Federal Reserve wanted a collateral to extend credit. At that time, they created, of course, the IRS. They put all the U.S. citizens in the bankruptcy as a collateral for the national debt. So basically your labor from 18 years old till 65, it's pledged to pay the national debt, which is not even yours. It's the government's debt. And that's why they created the IRS. Now, this is all statutes. This is all based on U.S. citizen. Uh, one of the essential things of creating or putting all the children in this big corporation was the birth certificate. In 1921, there was a maternity act which passed. And basically, it was for the protection of the mothers. However, basically, it's created an entity that mothers, they can register their children and get a certificate. That's the birth certificate. Anytime that you get a certificate, guess what? You surrender title, you get a permission. It doesn't matter in this country what you own. It matters who controls it, who has a security interest. The same thing we do it with cars, the same thing we do it with the houses when we rec recorded the county recorder, the DMV when we uh, file it, the car with the DMV. We get a certificate. A certificate is not ownership. It's a proof that the owner giving you a permission. Otherwise, it's illegal. So you surrender it, and it's a voluntary compliance, by the way. You surrender it. Once you surrender it, it becomes a revocable contract. So now you don't own it. That's why you have to pay property tax. You have to pay um, taxes, income taxes. You have to pay uh, all kinds of taxes. So we are in the system. I don't care all this organization. And, I, and I've heard for the last 10 years, a lot of people, they talk about um, constitutional rights. They go to the courts. As soon as they start talking about Bill of Rights Constitution, the judge will shut them down and he's going to say, well, if you start talking about Constitution, my court, I'm going to put you in jail. And you wonder, how can it be? The President of the United States takes his oath to, to defend the Constitution. Now, this judge is telling me, if I talk about it, I go to jail in his court. What happened? Well, the court system, the whole court system is in treason. And I'll tell you why. First of all, you have to pinpoint your enemies. IRS is not your enemy. IRS are people like you and me with one exception. They don't have any ethics left. So they work for the IRS. But besides that, they're not your enemy. Your real enemy is 
the Bar Association, which is a British corporation. This is what is controlling the whole United States. The judge tells you, you cannot practice law without having a license. You know why? Because all the laws, they're copyrighted by British corporations and uh, publishing companies out of Montreal. They write and they publish and they're copyrighted. If you use them, you're violating a copyrighted material. You go to jail. Not because you're not an attorney. It has nothing to do with that. You need to have a permission, a copyright permission. Now, being a foreign corporation out of Britain, England, coming in the United States, taking over all the court system, and according to the setup of the court, if you have a judge, he has to be a neutral person, has nothing to do with the court or the case. The prosecutor the same way, the clerk of the court the same way, everyone is the same way, and the attorney. However, the attorney is the officer of the court. The judge and the prosecuting attorney, they're all attorneys. Well, they all belong to the Bar Association. Nice family running the show. They cannot do that. All of them, they have vested interest. However, no one is objecting. So they just keep doing whatever they're doing. As long as you don't object, it becomes under color of law. They'll just keep doing. As a U.S. citizen, you cannot have a claim. You know why? Because you don't have one. You don't have a right. You don't have a right to own anything. You don't have a right to um, have a security interest. You don't even have a right to enter in a legal contract. That's why people, they, uh, they set up offshore trusts. However, if you are the trustee, the IRS will come and penetrate the trust because you are a U.S. person having control on the funds. And you can have all kinds of arguments. I've seen all of them. Still, if you are a U.S. citizen, they'll come after you. And yes, they have the right to get in. So this is the court system. And uh, of course, you have to know what you can do in the court. And a little bit of knowledge, it will help you a lot. We, we've got all kinds of material. I mean, and us, I mean, we have it, but there are so many other organizations that they have a lot of good stuff also. However, we put things together that works for people, and we, we stay behind it. The, um, the redemption process, as I said, uh, we sold thousands of books, by the way, and we had a lot of great successes and a lot of appreciations. Uh, the book, it's more expensive than a regular book. However, the reason why it's done that way so that we can finance the authors so that they can get us more good stuff. Um, just to tell you about the book, how good it is, in the last two years, selling thousands of them, I had one return. One return. And I sent him a letter personally to the client congratulating him that he is the first to ask for his money back because he doesn't like the book. So there is only one return. This is a record. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to say that. The best news that I'm going to give you today is probably it's beyond everything else that I talked today. This stuff that I told you about, the traffic ticket, the money brief, all these things, you can do it um, right now in the system. However, we've got really a breakthrough in the whole system. And it's the only question that everyone was asking for years. How can we get out of the system and how can we stop paying legally income tax? Is it possible? Oh, yes, it is. Uh, till, I would say last year it wasn't, but now it is. Um, we did a lot of research on this subject, and we cannot, of course, take anyone's uh, word for granted. So we did a lot of checkings, we did a lot of research, we went through 200 cases, and finally we got a product that basically it will take every single person out of the jurisdiction of the United States which is the expatriation pro process. Now, expatriation, I heard about this process 10 years ago. I was following it. And basically, people that they're filthy rich, millionaires, they used to get out of the country, go to an American embassy, surrendering all their documents, and they say, good luck. I don't want to be part of this. I'm happy outside, and that's the end of it. Well, the government saw that this is not... Uh, a good practice, so they said that we're going to change the rules. If you're going to expatriate that way, we need to clear the account, which is the IRS account. 
However, I am not against it. Why should I decide to live offshore if I like this place? I like to live in United States of America. I like California. Why should I be forced to live in Europe or somewhere else? Because basically, I don't want to get involved in a fraudulent compliance. So basically, we have a way now for every single person to get out of it, out of the system, legally, and you will have the approval of five chief officers of the United States, by the way, including the president. Um, I've seen 200 cases already. Every single one of them, they're out. Once you're out, no longer IRS filings. You have no business with the IRS. As an American citizen, you have no business with the IRS. Plus, you have no business with the court system. This is important because a court system, it's based on statutes. It's based on regulations of corporations. All these statutes, over 60 million, it's created for corporations. Now, your name, you have a, two names, by the way. Actually, you have one name, real name, and you have a mirror image name, which is all capital letters. That all capital letters is a corporate entity, fictitious name. It's not you. It's created by government so that they can have jurisdiction on you. You're the surety for that name. That's how they get you. Not because the government is really on top of the people. No, no. The government is not. That corporate name, which is created by government, they have jurisdiction. And if you think you're that person, all the laws, all the statutes applies to you. That's why the UCC works. You accept that name for value. Register it as your own asset. And now you can use it as a private entity. However, because of the name, all these rules and regulations applies to you. Now, how can we get out of it? In order to find the problem, you don't go today's problem. You have to go back and see where it started so that you can solve it from the beginning. There are two contracts. This is very important now. There are two contracts that it makes you a U.S. citizen. One of them is when you, when you first participated in the Social Security Program. They call it SSI, Social Security Insurance. The second contract is when you use the postal service to send your mail. And this is basically um, a judge which basically uh, made a statement that these are the two contracts asking the bailiff, does he pay Social Security? Yes. Uh, does he use it the postal uh, service? Yes. He is a U.S. citizen. That's the only proof that they need to prove that you are a U.S. citizen. I'll explain you why the Social Security Insurance. Social Security Insurance when you have a child, you apply for Social Security. That's not a contract. It's just the application. When your child is age 18 and he starts working, the first dime that he puts in the Social Security account, it makes him a U.S. citizen. And I'll tell you why. A child under 18 legally, he cannot enter in any contract. He cannot have legally any claim against anyone. He cannot own anything. So he's always depending on his parents and he's always depending on his guardian, whoever is going to take care of him. He's a child till 18. Once he becomes 18, now he's working. This is exactly what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're age 65, you are still considered a child because you cannot take care of yourself. You're, you're incompetent. This is the rules and regulations, by the way. That's why you cannot have any claim, you cannot own anything, and I don't care what kind of allodial titles you will do, still they will hammer you down because you are a U.S. citizen, 14th Amendment, it's a slave, basically, to the U.S. corporation. The second thing is, however, there is a fraud in this process. You never thought that they're going to take care of your welfare. You thought that it's a mandatory. And the second thing is, you are participating in the Social Security Insurance, which is SSI. Now it's FICA. Social Security Insurance, you think about it's an insurance policy. Well, insurance policy is in black and white. You pay so many payments as of now at age 65, you will get so much. And if you don't, then there is a life insurance policy. That's a contract, you know up front. However, 
according to one of the Supreme Judges, social security is not an insurance policy, it's a welfare policy. That's why at age 65, they're not obliged to pay you a penny if there is nothing in that welfare policy. If it's an insurance, they should have the funds, but it's not, it's a welfare. There was a fraud, but no one is complaining, so they keep going with it. The second reason why you are a U.S. citizen, you're using the Postal Service. Well, what am I going to use then if I cannot use the Postal Service? And why the Postal Service? Well, there was another fraud. The Postal Service in 1970, all the employees, they were transferred. Every, everyone was transferred to the Postal Office employees. They were transferred to Postal Service. What is the difference? The Postal Office of the United States, it's the de jure office that the government created to serve the American people. There are only five employees at that office, and they're all in Washington, D.C. And the price of the stamp is the same, two cents for uh, Washington, D.C., three cents nationwide. Who's Postal Service? Postal Service is a private corporation. You will see it says United States Postal Office, you think this is the postal office for the United States, you go in, as soon as you give your letter, that's the postal service handling it for you. Well, they never told me that. Well, why are you a U.S. citizen if you're using postal service? Because basically they're tied up with the army, military. You are doing business with the military. And the government owns all the addresses and all the zip codes. And that mail, it's going through the Postal Service to one of those addresses which belongs to the government. However, the only way you can get out of a contract, and I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about this, is to prove that there was a fraud committed in a contract. Extremely hard. However, if it's in black and white, they cannot argue. The Social Security, the name, it's Social Security Insurance. It was a welfare. You've got the proof you can prove the fraud. When it comes to the Postal Service, you're advertising United States Postal Office. No one told me that when I get in, it's the Postal Service. So that's another fraud. Now, assuming that you got out of these two contracts, which you will, how can we get out of the U.S. corporation? A lot of people, they have, they've tried a lot of systems, a lot of um, statements, um, shouting about it, radio talk shows, going to the courts and arguing with the judge. Nothing works. You've got to have to cite the law which gives you the right to expatriate. Expatriate from United States Corporation and at the same time, impatriate as an American citizen. You see, you have dual citizenship as an American, as a U.S. citizen, and they're both tied up together. Once you leave one, the other is going to go unless you impatriate at the same time. So, what can we do so that we can do this process? And under what legality we can do? This is what I wanted to talk about today. Now, when they passed the 14th, uh, 40th Congress, when they passed the 14th Amendment, it was on... Let me see, where is the paper? July 27, 1868. Now, they passed this amendment, however, they knew that if they don't give you a way out, this is treason, big times. If, and if you can expose them, you know, they can be hanged. So guess what? One day before the 14th Amendment passed, which is July 27, 19, 1868, the 40th Congress passed a bill, which is very interesting, I'm going to read it. By the way, I do have a copy of the, uh, the Authority of Congress Statutes at Large uh, Treaties, and I can give you one of these. But this is exactly what it says. Where it says the right of expatriation is a natural and inherent right of all people, indispensable to the enjoyment of the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and where is in the recognition of this principle, this government has freely received immigrants from all nations and invested them with the rights of citizenship, and where is, he's talking about U.S. citizenship, 
And where is it is claimed that such American citizens, this is the first time you will see American citizens, with their descendants are subjects of foreign states, we'll see who is that foreign states, owing allegiance to the governments thereof, and where is it is necessary to the maintenance of public peace that this claim of foreign allegiance should be promptly and finally disavowed. Therefore, be it enacted by the Senate and representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that any declaration, instruction, opinion, order, or decision of any officers of this government which denies, restricts, impairs, or questions the right of expatriation is hereby declared inconsistent with the fundamental principles of this government. Basically what they're saying that it is the right of the American citizen to expatriate from the U.S. government and if you do so to the proper channels, the government cannot question or deny because you're not requesting it. You don't request an American citizen. You just make a statement, a declaration. Now, Section 2 is very interesting. This applies to me and some other people that they're not born in the United States. And it is further enacted that all naturalized citizens of the United States while in foreign states shall be entitled to and shall receive from this government the same protection of persons and property that is accorded to native-born citizens in like situations and circumstances. So basically, if you're naturalized, you're born in another country and you're immigrant, you're naturalized here, still you have the same right as an American citizen so that you can expatriate being an American citizen and you can impatriate as an American citizen. Now, what are the advantages of doing this? As an American citizen only, the court doesn't have any stand to deal with you. None of the statutes, none of the judges, none of the attorneys applies to you. Um, anyone wants to sue you, corporations, credit cards, good luck. No one can use the court system against you. As long as you didn't damage anyone, by the way, you didn't harm anyone, then there will be a common law procedure. And we do have common law, by the way. No one is using it. So expatriation, get out of the U.S. corporation, impatriate. According to this, they gave us already the remedy one day before. How did you find this document? Well, it was hidden. It's been 120 years old, but it's there. It's been passed one day before the 14th Amendment, and nobody knew about this. Well, through the Freedom of Information, we have the bill, and every single person can use this right. It's been given by the Congress, the 40th Congress, one day before the, the uh, 14th Amendment. So no one can argue about this. So you have the right. Now, over here it says foreign states. Well. Someone is going to say, well, I don't know if they're, they're, they're talking about California or Arizona or whatever. Who's these foreign states? Well, it doesn't say foreign country. It says foreign states. So I'm going to have Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution states. The United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a Republican form of government. Therefore, the 50 states are foreign states to the United States whose boundary is within the confines of Washington, D.C., 10 miles square. So, they're talking about foreign states, not country, and over here we have Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. It clears in black and white, says, who is the foreign state for the United States. Now, uh, we spoke about law and status. We, attorney. Of course, attorney is an officer of the court, so any time that you hire an attorney, basically you're surrendering all your constitutional rights. You are saying to the court that I need someone to speak on behalf of me. I'm incompetent, I cannot go forward. And you are surrendering your right to represent yourself. And you are surrendering your right to ask the court for their jurisdiction, to ask you to appear. If you do that then, it's all up to the attorney. If he says you're guilty, you're guilty, you're done. You cannot even do anything. So anything that you're going to do, um, either don't do it or make sure that you don't have an attorney. Otherwise, officer of the court, their first priority is the court. Even though you hire them, you pay them, their first priority is the court. So no matter what you do, they're going to go with the flow. Otherwise, they're out. 
Um, remember that um, one of the things that I find treason in the court system that the attorney, the judge, the prosecutor, of course all these members of the bar, however, every single case, since this is a business and they're really good salespeople, every single case that they try, they have a percentage. Did you know that? They get a percentage that goes directly to their pension. So they have a vested interest to make sure that the more they get, the better for everybody. And it funds their clubs, it funds their private um, um, vacation uh, locations, it funds all kinds of golf courses and all the goodies that they have enjoyed. Uh, everything is funded as a percentage out of the proceedings that you and I, uh, we pay as clients. Okay. We're going to Black Law Dictionary, 4th or 5th edition. I want to say something about licenses because people still, they have a confusion about the license. Even though I mentioned, I would like to read the words. Licensing, license. Permission from a competent authority to do something that without the permission would be illegal, a trespass, or a tort. So if you don't get a license to get married, I guess it's a tort. So you need to have a license. Or if you're going to drive the car, you need a license. And as I said, as long as you get a permission, that means you're surrendering your rights to a third party and you're asking them to take care of you. Um, with the expatriation, by the way, this is the last thing that I'm going to talk about. With the expatriation, by the way, you do not have to surrender any documents. Uh, it's very neat. There are five chief officers of the United States will be notified, including the president, the commissioner of the IRS, um, the governor of the state, the governor of the, um, um, of the U.S., and also there is one more person that will be notified, uh, which is, I think, the, uh, the treasurer of the United States. Now, when, you, when we prepare all these documents, we include inside that since the government created a system that we cannot live like anyone else without using social security or driver's license or passports so we are going to use all these documents as an American citizen because there is no replacement however we are going to accept them without prejudice and that's the key word without prejudice before your signature and nothing applies whatever the contract it means so basically you will be able to use all the documents that it's been issued unless they replace the passport, U.S. passport, with the green one, which you used to have, which is the state passport, which has nothing to do with the United States. However, they're telling us they don't have it. The only thing is U.S. passport, a blue one. So we will use it since they created that situation. However, without prejudice. So once you expatriate, you keep all your documents. You keep all your bank accounts, credit cards. Just be a good citizen. However, there is a way of handling situations without prejudice. You go to the bank, change your signature card. That's not your signature anymore, without prejudice sign. Bank refused to give you the card, go back home, send them a registered letter, notifying them, as of today, this is not my signature, and that's the end of it. So you will learn how to maneuver, very simple procedure, and of course, if anyone is interested about this and you think it's valuable, we do have all the applications, and uh, we've done over 200 already with no problems. So afterwards, you can come and see us at the, at the table. Thank you. Yes. I want to thank all of you for being here with us. This subject is far more potent and important uh, when you start uh, thinking about the implications of for the first time living as a free American in your own country uh, the implications are horrendous uh, I am telling you that the Queen of England the British royalty uh, the whole Bar Association the entire superstructure of law in this country is designed to uh, keep us 
and slavery. Because remember, in any kind of a large confrontation between gangs, between countries, when there's a lot of bloodshed and violence, the presidents and the kings of those countries, if they get defeated in battle, they, they have a grudge to pay back. Then it's not over. It's like the mafia says, you know, you if you if you've killed somebody, uh, you know, you better go lay down somewhere because it's not over until it's over. You may have beat us, but it's not over yet. And consequently, that's the exact situation we're in today. We defeated the British on the field of battle and got our freedom, but the King of England and British royalty and the international banking cartels out of London have never forgot the beating they got. And they're not through with us yet. They have decided to use conspiracy, plots, schemes, uh, associations, secret societies to usurp the freedom of this country and the people of this country. And they didn't tell us all you've got to do is just stand on your own feet and declare yourself an American and you're out of all of this mess. I personally want to see this catch fire across this country. I think it's an idea whose time has come. Uh, one more thing, probably I didn't mention, once you expatriate, that's the end of the filings and the IRS, by the way. That's out of the question. Um, so you're not going to hear from them. Of course, when you hear from uh, one of the agents of the IRS, they, have nothing, they, they don't know what's happening. They will still send you probably a letter. All you have to do is just put expatriation papers with a cover letter, sending it to him, just telling him that, why don't you talk with your boss, the commissioner of the IRS, and know who I am. And that's going to be the end of it, that you're going to hear from them. It's the same thing with the court. If you receive anything from the court, they don't know who you are. Uh, basically, you put your expatriation documents with a letter and send it to them, and that's the end of it. They have no jurisdiction on you. For businesses, this is a good question. Uh, if it's a corporation, it's a creation of government with statutes. However, uh, we have a program which you can convert your whole business, put it in an expatriation situation with a trust, a business trust, and um, you'll be out of it, basically. Now, we're going to, first of all, let me say, we're going to have a question and answer period for about two to two and a half hours very soon. We're going to come back here, and it's going to be, uh, that in the end of the evening, it's going to be a question and answer period. And at that time, I think it would be the appropriate time to ask all the questions. We're going to be sitting here. We're going to answer them all the best we can. So, uh, because we don't want to run over, and we're running over right now. I can guarantee you one thing. Hello? Yeah. I can get at you. The UCC process, it took two years for 11 million to process. Expatriation, I'm pretty sure in one year it will be over 50 million, they will do it. And the reason why they will do it, because in the redemption we have successes and we have losses also. It's a complicated procedure. However, redemption is so, uh, expatriation is so easy to understand. You don't have to do nothing. We prepare the papers, by the way. We do have a service that all the papers are prepared. All you have to say is, I would like to do it. And that's the end of it. And once you send it, after 20 days, you're out of it. So it's as simple as that. However, I don't know what kind of news is this for you guys, but we will spread the news as fast as possible. Whoever wants to do this process and at the same time interested to spread the word, please come and see us. Uh, uh, address. All right. Contact information for us. For us? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll start with the phone number. 818 area code 757. Now, at our, at our table, if you go back to our table, you will have, uh, I photocopied uh, our address, all the information on us, and it's free. Just pick up. All the products, we have it on the web. The website name is www.bbcoa.com. Simple. The phone number is 818-757-7123.
818-757-7123. The fax number is 818-757-1092. The website is BBC, like BBC of England, BBCOA.com. Dot, dot um, email address is info, I-N-F-O, at bbcoa.com um, if you have specific problems we're there to help you so you can send us an email however the amount of emails we receive it's a lot so if it takes us a few days to get back um, you know we apologize up front okay. now one other thing I'd like to bring to your attention is that many years ago when this country was founded people that came from all over the world to America they were expatriating from their countries, from all over the world. People were coming to come to America to, to be American citizens. So consequently, they were leaving their country. They were leaving their country. Yeah, well, that's, but originally they were repatriating to America but, uh, and uh, the um, and the uh, what you're talking about has to do with state citizenship, but I don't want to get into state citizenship. I want to stay on the American citizenship. But I understand what you're saying. The country is America, and you're repatriating to America. And at the time the country was set up, there were different states. And yes, it has to do with state citizenship back then but there is still the American citizenship, and we can get into all of that tonight. I wasn't going to bring up state citizenship. Yeah, American citizenship is basically the corporation, which is the government. You're expatriating from the corporate government. You're not expatriating from the American uh, United States of America. So I hope you understand. Because I'm well aware of the, of the state citizenship material. Uh, uh, Richard McDonald is... Uh, Right, anyway, I don't know. Uh, anyway, this is the well, yeah. But the book, uh, the book that they really need to get is the uh, is the uh, the code book. Yeah, the code book. We have a few left at our table, and it will talk about the Uniform Commercial Code. And come over to the table. You'll see what we've got, and uh, we can talk then and give you all the information. And again, we're going to be back here tonight uh, with the question and answer period. Thank you for being here. Thank you.